The following production is part of the Play Some Video Games Podcast Network. inner demons and welcome to board with video games the gaming podcast that strives for the right balance of coverage for games you play on your table and on your television you can think of us as the buzz lightyear and woody of gaming podcasts we're a proud member of the psvg podcast network and a member of the make us better team over on patreon i'm one of your hosts kyle and joining me on this co-op adventure the only guy i would want to go to infinity and beyond with josh how are you doing this evening oh shucks i'm flattered I am doing okay. I'm dealing with my cat allergies due to my new cat. <laughs> I'm <laughs> really disappointed. <laughs> I'm really disappointed you not did not pick Sparky for the name. Again, I know Sparky's a dog, but in the world of video game or, or board game animals, Sparky is pretty great. That's fair. Sorry to disappoint you. It's okay. I'm sure it won't <laughs> be the last time. <laughs> You're probably right. It probably happened during this episode. (laughs) Um, Funny thing, what I was going to write, though, when I did this little show intro, the initial thing when you said, ah, shucks, I was actually going to talk about how you're the only person I'd want to go into an incinerator with. Uh, But I figured that might be a little bit of a bleak way to start the show. So I didn't go there, but I thought we could laugh about it after I did it the normal way. But there was also like six of them in there. That is very true. So maybe that would have to be a whole PSVG group slash episode for that one. So anyway, we really probably should just do a movie podcast at some point because I feel like we end up talking about movies at some point all the time. Trying to stop me. (laughs) (laughs) So. All right. But hey, you know, this isn't a movie podcast. It is a gaming podcast. So thanks so much for joining us this week. As always, send any feedback, questions, suggested topics to at board with VG on Twitter and Instagram. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash board with VG. Feel free to give us a five star rating over there. Also, if you want to communicate in the long form, still waiting for that first fan fiction, board with VG at gmail.com and use the hashtag board with VG on all the social medias. So we can check out all the awesome things you're playing and stay connected with all of you. If you're interested in helping make us better, check out patreon.com slash make us better. Big thanks to all the supporters over there. And if you're interested in getting bored with VG on his own podcast feed, that's right. We might, we're, we're trying to go out on our own, branch out, be cast aside from the nest, if you would, and, and fly um, giving us a dollar or two over on Patreon would really help that happen. That is a, a new goal that has been added, is getting all of the PSVG feeds onto their own individual podcast feeds. Though I know you all love listening to all of the shows that ha- come out like basically every day. Uh, if that is something you'd be interested in, having that dedicated board with video games feed, check out patreon.com slash make us better. And maybe if you have a dollar or two, you could help make that happen. And finally, as the last bit of housekeeping, big thank you to everyone who submitted a Metafall submission for the contest to win a sweet, awesome video game this fall. Good luck to everyone. I hope the Metacritic scores are in your favor. And who knew that saying that I was going to pick the PS4 scores for those multi-platform games were going to matter so much. Looking at you, Tomb Raider. Who knew there'd be such a difference between the Xbox One scores and the PS4 scores? Goodness me, I did not anticipate that happening. <laughs> it's like six points right now. It's a big swing. Yeah, it's a big sure. swing between the two. So, But hey, that, that contest is going to take a while. We won't be hearing the end of that for some time. But Josh, enough of the housekeeping. What have you been playing on your tabletop, sir? So I went ahead and continued to break my rule about not buying games until PAX. <laughs> um, but I haven't bought any big, expensive games. So I think I'm still doing good. Um I was in Target, as I am, every week, getting baby stuff, looking at the board games, uh, wanting, <laughs> just hoping. And um, th- we have, like, so we have three Targets in the area. Uh, I typically go to one, and I always hear, like, my wife's like, I was at this one, and they had all these different, they even had Azul. And I'm like, well, why don't I go to this Target and check it out just to see? And they do have a better board game selection just 
a few miles away from the other ones, which is odd. Um, so I noticed there were a couple new games by Mattel. They were they're fifteen dollar games, and they're two player games. They're literally labeled two player strategy game. Uh, right on the cover, it's part of the box art, so it kind of takes away a little bit of the shelf appeal. Uh, but you know, I figured I would give it a shot. We had to play something this weekend, and and I knew my time was short because of this video game I was playing. Uh, I didn't want to give up too much time to that. So um, it's called Spirits of the Wild. Um, it's by Nick Hayes. I'm not familiar with him. It's by Mattel Games. They have like a new logo, so I'm assuming maybe it's like a new branding for them. Um, I didn't really know what to expect of it. It's called the Mystical Stone Taking Strategy Game. Uh, if you look on the back of the box, it looks like this weird like Mancala hybrid. It's not, but that's what kind of like the first impression I got was. Um, but it is a two-player game, so uh, it takes 30 minutes. That was appealing, and it's ten, ages 10 plus, so I figured it would be pretty easy to learn uh, and to play. So what essentially what you do is each player has a board, and you are literally playing with the spirits of the wild. So you have two decks of spirits, and these spirits give you uh, powers. I shouldn't call them decks. It's two stacks of three cards each. It's not really a, it's like a, a deck-ish. Um, and then each player has a hand. And when you play your hand, you play it out in front of you. You have five cards, six cards, sorry. And they are played face up. And how it works is as you activate them, you flip them to their backside, showing that you've used the card. And essentially what you're doing is you're drawing... Um, stones as they call them in the game and they're all different colors and you're trying to fill your board um if you listen to when i talked about herbaceous it's very similar play style to herbaceous where on your board are uh, uh five or six spirit animals and each spirit animal has a prerequisite to be met so say like this is probably not exactly what it is but say it's like a tortoise and it has a board and has a bunch of circles and it's like um one of each different color so your goal is to fill as many empty holes as there are with one of each different color game and then you have these special um spirit stones that are in the bag that you need to if you place it on a completed um spirit of the forest you get double so how that works is say you get seven points for the tortoise if you get that stone that gives you 14 the game ends when five of the spirit stones are visible on the board, whether they're in the um, saucer where you're drawing from or on each other's boards. So the game will ultimately go faster if you're playing cards that make you draw more stones or play more stones. And then some of the big spirit animals will say, like, um, some of them say, uh, draw two stones from the bag and take an extra turn, or draw four stones from the bag and take one. Uh, the cards in front of you are uh, take one stone, take two stones, take two stone, uh, take two stones out of the bag and draw one, take three stones and move the fox. Now the fox is this little pawn. It's kind of like the robber in Catan. And what you do is you'll place it on one of your opponent's animals. And that will block them from making any moves on that animal until the fox moves to your the other person. Uh, and that's basically the game. Pretty simple, pretty easy. But the production quality is very high. It's a very nice looking game. The pieces are great. Um, for 15 bucks, it's, it nailed it. It looks very good. Um, everything feels good. The cards aren't too light. They're not... They're not thick, but they're not too light. And you're not really, you're not holding them in your hand. So the wear and tear isn't going to be as as much as it would be for a standard game because you're just keeping them in front of you on the table, which is nice. Um, and as you're drawing those spirit animals, they basically, you take the top card and you put it below and they keep recycling. So um, you're always con consistently doing that. Quick turns, you take one move on your turn, the next person goes. Etc. Etc. So um, I really enjoyed it. 
for 15 bucks. It's an easy recommendation for me, for All anyone, right. honestly. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So that is Spirits of the Wild, available at Target. Yes. Josh recommends, but pretty not too challenging is what you're saying. It's not it's not challenging, but I would say it's when when I played, I only filled three of my animal spots out of six. So there's definitely variety um in how you play. So there definitely is still strategy, but it does say 10 plus. I think that's a good age range. I think like not too hard to pick up, but definitely worth multiple plays. Gotcha. All right. Is that the only board game then? Because I know our video game conversation is probably going to be a little lengthy today. Yeah, it's the only board game I played, uh, and, and only because we made time Sunday night to play it. So I got a like a last minute. Gotcha. All right. So I attempted to play a board game as well. Attempted. I like the sound of that. Attempted. And here's the reason that I say attempted is I played it. It was played. I have no idea if I played it right, and I really didn't like what I played. Ooh, so. Nice. What's that? Oh, I'm excited to hear that. So the game that I gave a world to is a game called 60 Seconds to Save the World. It is designed by Jason Tagmeyer and is published by AEG. (laughs) I know. You know what this game is? You sent sent this game. (laughs) What? I sent it to you. You did. You sent me this game. You sent me this game last year. Yeah. (laughs) And I was like, well, we'll give this a world now. I'm trying to find something that's a little shorter to play to get in. You know, it's a cooperative card game, two to six players. There's some hand management in it. There's some press your luck, a little bit of set collection, I guess. And, you know, I wasn't certain what game I wanted to play. So I pulled this one out and said, okay, I'm going to go look at Board Game Geek and I'm going to see what information about this game exists. The answer is not much. There is very, very little information about this game, even on Board Game Geek, which then right away is is a little concerning that if board game geek doesn't have much information you know that the game is probably not very popular right. for example in the forums there are a total of nine threads total in every single section of the forum all together there are nine threads so i said you know it's fine i'm going to learn this game and i'm going to give it a whirl so i sat down pulled out the rule book set everything up started playing it and I have no idea how to play this game from reading the rule book. So then I was like, Oh, this will be fine. I'll go to YouTube. I will find, you know, maybe not Rodney Smith, but someone who is going to take me through the rules about how to play this game. Nothing, nada, (laughs) nothing exists. And then I realized Josh, how spoiled I have gotten by let's plays and how to plays and especially Rodney Smith's Watch It Played, explaining rules to me. Because I sat down with this game, which I don't think is super complex, but there's not even a complexity rating for it on Board Game Geek. I don't think it's that hard. I couldn't understand what to do. I read the rules like four times, five times, and I really couldn't totally understand what I was supposed to be doing. I know it's a cooperative game, I know we're supposed to try to save the world. Basically what happens is at the beginning of each game, you pick a scenario and that scenario is going to have a different way that you need to solve it. And you have different, there's variable player powers. So you kind of pick which leader you're going to be. um, And you have a map of the world, which is just cards put together that have the different continents on them. And you are then on your turn. You either, you have a, a terminal in front of you that you are putting cards onto. So you can either add cards to the terminal which then give you additional abilities of things you can do, or you can execute an order from the terminal. So on your turn, you can do up to two actions, but you can duplicate an action if you want to. So you could put two cards in your terminal if you want. The thing that's hard is that once you take an action, there you have to get rid of all the cards in your terminal, I think. But I don't know if they're just the cards you use or all of them. And then you can only use those to enact one of two things to either communicate or enact a plan. But then for communication, there's like four different ways you could communicate. You could have a press conference or you could send a fax and those like things are represented differently. Um, And then to enact a plan, you have to do like one of three things, but I don't really know exactly how to do those three things either, even from reading the rules. (laughs) So 
I was a little perturbed and frustrated. Now, I will say I did not make any posts on Board Game Geek about this, and the designer, uh, Jason Tagmeyer, seems to respond to everyone who poses a question or something um, uh, or has some sort of concern or something they don't understand. So it seems like he's doing a great job of reaching out and um, trying to connect and help people through it. I will say, though, that the most common thread you see are people who are like, I just don't understand the rules of this game. Like, I don't understand what I'm supposed to do. So right now, I don't know if I recommend this game or not because I, I, well, I can say I don't recommend it with how the rules currently are. If there was a quick reference guide or a really good walkthrough video or rewritten rules, this game might be really fun. But when I played it, all I felt was frustration because I never, ever knew if I was doing things the way I was supposed to or within the rules even. Uh, and that's even after reading, like I said, the rule book's not super long, but I read it four, five, six times. And mm-hmm. I, I'm not totally certain if I was doing things correctly. So that's 60 seconds to save the world. I might try it again. I <laughs> will have to dis- wait here and decide. But right now it's it's tough for me to recommend the game just because the rules are really rough. And there's not another great resource that I could find to really learn how to play the game. Fun. Yeah, (laughs) it was was good. So with that, Josh, let's talk about something I think that's going to make us both or put us both a little bit in a better mood. What have you been playing on your television, sir? Let's talk about it, huh? Well, I've been playing what you've been playing. I've been playing what you've been playing that everyone's been playing (laughs) that has a PlayStation 4. Oh, except for Donnie. Except for Donnie. <laughs> Donnie refuses. And now he's totally being like the uh, hipster about it of like, no, I don't care. It's not cool. Whatever. Let me tell you how much cooler this Pokemon game I'm going to play in two months is than your stupid Spider-Man. Like, that's what no. he's doing right now. At this point, it's okay. If he wants to miss out on the game of the year, then that's on him. <laughs> you know he would never pick this game of the year. But, hey, that's going to be an interesting conversation. It won't be for his game of the year, but... <laughs> There's no way this game, well, that's not true. This game will definitely be nominated, I can tell you that. Um, I mean, there's so much I could say about the game. Um, where would I start? Are we? Then, I'm assuming we're attempting to say spoiler-free. Have you finished the story yet? I haven't finished the story yet, okay. so spoiler-free. I, won't even, I don't even really want to spoil anything, because there's so much goodness in this game. So... I think I'll start by saying a conversation that we had in Discord today um, kind of made me realize something odd. Um, so, like, I grew up on Spider-Man cartoons. They're they're all over the place. But not only that, but Spider-Man was also all over the place because he was in the X-Men cartoon occasionally. He was in all these other, like, he was with the Avengers. He was on all these other channels. Um, and I read the comics as a kid, specifically like the Todd McFarlane run of Spider-Man. Um, you know, he's kind of all over the place, but I never really identified him as like my favorite superhero or or even like my favorite Marvel superhero. Like it was never really something I, I he was just Spider-Man, like everyone knows Spider-Man. So playing this game, like everything that happens, like, I'm so aware of, but in a, in such a, if that makes sense, like I know all these characters, I know this universe, but I never realized how like passionate and like excited I was about the characters mm-hmm. and, and Peter Parker. And I think that varies based on who plays Peter Parker. Right. Um, uh, but Everything that I'm experiencing, while it's familiar, is brand new. And it's really weird for me right now because it's such a weird sensation. Like, I'm like, is Spider-Man my favorite (laughs) superhero? Where is this coming from? Like, I think it's because the game is is so good that it's really uh, uh, inflaming. It's really making my my Spider-Man nostalgia really, like, shine and and it's a game that i find rare where you're getting better as a player as your character is getting better so you're playing peter parker peter parker is becoming a more proficient better spider-man but you're also becoming a better player at the same time and they do it very subtly like as you're leveling up 
you know, you'll slowly like f- plus five percent like swing speed, mm-hmm. plus plus ten percent attack. Like it's very like you could even not pay attention to it, and because like you just go okay, I got an attribute point, and not like pay attention to anything else, and just feel you just feel like you're becoming Spider Man. Like I'm at a point now where I'm like the combat is so fluid. It's so much better than Batman. Yeah. That, like Batman, I felt, and maybe that's the difference. Batman's not a superhero, so maybe I'm feeling more that I'm putting more of work into Batman combat. Oh boy! I'm try to save it. Kevin uh, Austin's gonna be so angry. <laughs> <laughs> but like, super, Spider-Man is a super superhuman, a super like he's not a normal human like Batman. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Batman is my favorite hero of all time. Which so it's weird for me to say like Spider Man's better than all the Batman games. It's really weird to say that, but I really feel like it is on every level. Um, if I would if I would critique it a little bit, there's like the big there's a line that it's blurring between paralleling Batman and being Batman. Um, so without using any spoilers, there's literally a whole side mission arc that is copy paste from batman arkham knight and it kind of bothered me but they did (laughs) the story part of it they did it well enough to separate that for me but i'm like they're literally stealing from rock (laughs) study like a whole thing and i don't think consider this game at all like a like a stealing from anything it's more like uh hey this fighting system works for this new generation of superhero games we're going to use it i don't think there's anything wrong with that because it's definitely different enough from rack studies fighting system that it's not copying per se but there was one mission and people will know it when they play it if they've played (laughs) arkham knight they'll know it right away um because right from the very first interaction with it i'm like i know this (laughs) um but I feel like I'm kind of rambling with no direction. You want to steer me or steer the conversation in a specific direction? Yeah. So first I'll talk about, because I've obviously been playing too, what percent complete are you right now? I didn't check because I'm probably 70% because okay. I finished every side quest today. All right. So you're quite a bit further than I am. I'm in the full, I think I'm pushing 50 is okay. where I'm at right now. Um, what are your thoughts on, well, let's back up. What first, what were your expectations going into this game? Is this a game you were excited about? Was it, where was your anticipation and hype level for it? And how is it delivered in comparison to kind of what you were hoping or what you were, you know, kind of ideally looking to get out of the game? Well, for me, I think like you, I didn't watch too much about the game before it came out. Um, At least I tried to avoid it. Um, so honestly, my real my real expectation was Spider Man Infamous, which I would have been fine with. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we saw some of the swinging stuff. I didn't think it would be as good as it is. It's really good. <laughs> it's it's mind blowing. Like every time I play it, I'm astounded how they could achieve it, achieve what I'm doing. How right. I can achieve what I'm doing. Now, never mind them designing it. Like. It's impressive that I can do what I want to do. It, it, it turns on a dime if you want it to. The way you can control swinging and all that, it's great. So, like, it, it way surpassed my expectations uh, right off the bat. Yeah, I was excited about this game just because I thought it looked cool. I hadn't been watching a lot of, especially the most recent stuff they had been releasing where they had been like, here's a combat video, here's a story trailer. Like, I didn't watch any of that stuff. But obviously, I watched the reveal trailer, you know, the couple trailers they've had at E3 and all that good stuff. But I was just looking forward to playing the game. And I think for me, the idea and the thing that is fun is, yeah, the traversal in the game is awesome. Like, I loved the traversal in Infamous. But um, especially when you have the neon powers and from a second son, like how you get around the city is, is really awesome. And so being able to do that stuff is cool. Like if I don't want the fast travel, I think that's a good thing. And in this game, I never want the fast travel. And I yeah. think the fact that I feel like I'm getting better at it the entire time and it's not simple, but it's also not overly complex. Like you have to think about and kind of know what you're going to do. Um, so it doesn't just gift it to you. You have to try to do things like you can mess up, but like all, you know, 
not saying what specifically, but if you are having to chase something, you know, and you'll like bank around a corner and then you'll come see and there'll be a spot where like two buildings are really narrow and you're like, oh man, am I going to make it? And then you do and you feel awesome and you're like going through things. Like I think how fluid everything feels from the traversal to the combat, like how all that feels, I think is, is really awesome. And I think how much, you know, I'm not a huge comics guy. Like everyone knows that I'm not super into it, but if you were to tell me, or ask me, what is Spider-Man supposed to move like? It's like this. Like, to me, right. this is Spider-Man moving like Spider-Man, which I think, you know, the Batman, the Arkham games, like, Batman felt very heavy, mm-hmm. but he was supposed to, because he's Batman. Right. You right. know, and then you see this combat, and you're like, oh, it's got Ark- Arkham-style combat. Sure. You know, you have a parry button, you have a strike button, like, you have those things, so that's Arkham-style. But to me, it feels completely different. Yeah, I agree. You know, so I, I don't think it feels the same as that because the character feels so different and all of the gadgets and how the suits matter and all of the abilities that you have and how all of that plays into what you're doing and how that is all built. Like, I think it's really cool how they put all that together. Um, and it is just a really good package of a game. I'm enjoying the story thus far. I'm not super, super far in the story. The story is divided into three acts, which are trophies. I have the trophy for act one, but that's it so far. So that's how far I'll say I am in, as far as the story goes. Uh, I really want to do all of the side stuff. So yeah. like every time I'm on my way to a story mission, I'm like, oh, let's go to all these landmarks. Let's go get these backpacks. Let's go get all these things. Um, and I'm trying to like do less of that now and try to progress the story a little bit because... Uh, Game Informer does a game club where they play through games every once in a while, and they're like, yeah, you know, end of Act 1 is where we're going to end for the first episode. It should take you three to four hours. And I was like, it's going to be way longer than three to four hours to get to the end of Act 1. So I was like, maybe I should do more story missions than I've been doing. So, yeah, I'm really enjoying it. What has, for you, been the most surprising part of the game thus far? Uh, For me, from my experience is how much I wanted to do those side missions. Like, if you look at my Batman playthroughs, like, I play Batman for the story, hands mm-hmm. down. I love Batman. I don't love really trophies. I didn't even do all the Catwoman stuff. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, you know, I love the, Yeah, because those missions were annoying. Like, they weren't fun. Like, but I knew... I did a bunch because I knew, like, I want to get to the Catwoman. I like, drive the the Batmobile through tunnels to get to get like it was really bad in my opinion it really took away from my experience of the Batman game so doing I'm chasing pigeons for crying out loud (laughs) yes you are but it it doesn't bother me it's actually I feel like it's a challenge um but at the same time I'm enjoying it even if I have to like restart because because moving through the city is so enjoyable and it's so much fun. Um, and it's challenging, too, because now you're, like, you're trying to learn where you have to long shoot or where you swing or where you pull yourself up onto places. Like, you're learning the city at the same time. There's even missions where, like, you have to – they just give you a picture, and you have to find where that is in the city relatively. They kind of give you an area. But even that's fun because you're trying to, like, remember where things are. Um so that, for me, the most surprising thing is how much time I spent doing all this side stuff. And, like, there's times, like, I was excited to, um, like, a story mission came up that I was excited to go experience. So I'd stop doing the side stuff, and then I would go to my lab, my lab work. Mm-hmm. Uh, keep it spoiler-free. But I was, like, going to the lab, that's, like, one of my favorite parts of the story because I'm genuinely interested to see where it goes. So I'm like, oh, I get a lab story thing. I'll stop doing all the side stuff, go do that, and go back and do a whole bunch more side stuff. So today, I thought I got it all. I should have clarified. There was one um, one thing left on the whole map that I didn't notice, because they don't disappear when you complete them. Mm-hmm. You just get a check mark above them. So I right. thought I had nailed it. So I have one thing left that I was going to try to do tonight, but I think I'll do tomorrow. Um, and then I'll have all the side stuff complete. So yeah, yeah. I was surprised. Um, how about you? Uh, 
So for me, a couple things surprised me. Number one, the music in this game is incredible. Yeah, it's really right from start too, right from yeah. get go. Yeah, the music in this game is amazing. And not that I thought it was going to be bad. I just am really impressed with the music and how dynamic it is and how it fits what you're doing. I was just really impressed. Like I could listen to the music in this game all the time. So that was number one that really surprised me. Number two, a thing that I am I am fondly surprised by, and I think this maybe has a hand because Marvel, you know, is so involved with it, but it's the one thing I harp on for DC, especially the DC movies, um, that I feel like Marvel gets right and that you feel genuinely like you are doing good in this game. You are trying to help people. You are literally the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. You are going around and trying to help people and make the world a better place than what it was. Like, it is about doing good. And there is social commentary in there that might tick some people off. But, I, I mean, so, but it is very much about how can I make this place better and how can I help people? And you don't get that very often in, in video games. And genuinely, Peter Parker is, he he cares about people. Like, he is at the height of, and I don't think this is a spoiler to say, he's like at the height of being Spider-Man, but maybe at a pretty low point for being Peter Parker, as far as how things are going in oh, his yeah. life. You yeah, know what I'm saying? Sure. Like, yeah. he's an awesome Spider-Man, Peter Parker is struggling. And because of that, he, but he's still a positive person. And because of all that dynamic, like playing Spider-Man is fun because you get to go do sweet, awesome stuff, but you're interested in what's going on with Peter. So in the points where you are playing Peter Parker, that story to me is as compelling as and as interesting as the time I'm with Spider-Man is. And I think that's really impressive that they were willing to say, you know what, you're going to play a lot of this game as Peter Parker. A lot yeah. of the story is about Peter Parker. It's not necessarily about Spider-Man. It's about Peter. And I think that's a really daring thing that I am surprised I care about as much as I do, especially for someone who isn't really into the character or isn't really into the comics and doesn't have a ton of backstory with it. Like this, I'm really impressed at their ability to create this world where you feel like you are a hero, but that doesn't mean your life is perfect, but it's still focused on doing good and helping people and making the world a better place because we so rarely do that in video games we so typically have like the dark brooding protagonist who's just like raw you know like that's kind of the edginess that we want our video games to have as we've aged and like this game is not totally that i think they're i don't know for certain but anyway I'm just going to leave that there without <laughs> spoiling anything. But I like the fact that as you're going through the game, like you're generally trying to help people. Um, we've been talking about Spider-Man for a while. I don't want to leave Spider-Man quite yet because Donnie told us he said he wanted us to talk a lot about Spider-Man. So we're talking a lot about Spider-Man. <laughs> Do you have any nitpicks? Are there any things that you don't like? Are there things you wish they would have done differently thus far? So, yeah, I mean, it's tough to find, find nitpicks, to be honest, like, Besides that, that one specific mission set, which really it still it really does bug me because they could have <laughs> they could have done anything, right? They didn't have to copy paste a whole thing. Well, uh, I mean, I think they probably still did a lot of work. Okay, you know what I mean. Though. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know what I mean. Um, but I still enjoyed it. But just that's just me defending Batman there a little bit. Um, uh, yeah, you know there there's. In the game, there's stealth missions mm-hmm. without spoiling anything. Um, I don't love the sp- sp- I don't love specific ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't. I still find the story interesting in them, but I'm not a big fan of um, the way that I don't know if I had the right wording for it. I'm just not a big fan of them. To say I'm still enjoying them, but in comparison to the rest of the game, right. It it slows the game down a lot. It does. You have to basically change your whole play style, and if that's like you're not, if that's not like your style of gameplay, it can be a bummer. I think. I mean, I'm I'm fine with it, but it's just if I had to pick a low point, I would pick that. But that's really it, to be honest with you, so far. Um, I would I would even not even put it in a complaint category if I had to say, if I had to say if I had a complaint about the game, I really don't. Right. I think for me, I am one thing that I could see people complaining about that I don't care about, but I know some people do. Puddles. This is, what's that? Puddles. 
Puddles. I was actually going to ask you about puddles in the, <laughs> at the end of this, so we'll get to puddles in a moment. Um, <laughs> this is a very old school, quote unquote, old school open world game. Mm-hmm. You have a lot of stuff on the map. You have towers you're unlocking. There's lots of things on the map to go check off. Like all of that is very much there. I enjoy old school open world games. Like I, I like that, but I can understand where some people now that is not necessarily what they probably want as much. They're probably looking for something that is a little more immersive. Did you hear the news about uh, the new Assassin's Creed? No. So the new Assassin's Creed is actually giving you the option to either have a more directed story where it's going to be like all the stuff on the map, or you could do it through exploration mode where you just have to go find Hmm. what you're supposed to do. And you get to choose what to do and kind of how you want to experience the story there. And this is very much an old school Ubisoft, even, you know, your the correlation to Infamous, how like the Infamous map looked. This game is like that. So I think yeah. there could potentially be some pushback on that, that is very old school in that way. When you are, you know, there are crimes that will happen throughout the city and you have to go stop them. Man, in Marvel's New York, do a lot of people get kidnapped and put in <laughs> trunks. Let me tell you, you know, like you there's a little bit of that that happens now i still really like doing it like it's fun which i think makes it easier to overlook but i think there is kind of that old school mentality a little bit about this game so that's one potential thing i i I would say is, is i'm not wild about but outside of that i'm really having a good time with this game um i haven't heard anybody say yet about how you know that clearly they were influenced by breath of the wild because you can climb anything <laughs> and it because it's spider-man so he'd be able to anyway um <laughs> but you know i i am very surprised that i i'm just having a lot of fun with this game is this game a quote-unquote better game than god of war i don't think so am i having more fun than i had in god of war maybe i might be yeah um, I certainly am. <laughs> you know and I, and I think that's different you know i think those can be two different things um and speaking briefly of puddles, not even in a jokey, jokey way, but uh, I think this game now that is out and people have it in their hands, the fact that people were complaining about puddles, I think now is hilarious because this game is gorgeous. Yeah. It even is a... Ponds are like gorgeous. <laughs> yeah, this game is absolutely beautiful. So, and it runs buttery smooth. I, I've never had any technical issues. I, I haven't had any problems like that at all. And... You know, if you just look at the photos that are being done in photo mode with this game, like it is cuckoo bananas. This yeah. game is, is is a looker. So, yeah. Anything else you want to say? Want to add anything else you want to wax poetic about uh, about Spider Man before we move on? That Metacritic score is too low. I'll tell you that for this game. So, where for you right now? Because I know you said potentially one of your favorite games of all time. Yeah, it's like it's like it, it could it it could have beat Horizon if it was a little bit more difficult. Okay, how um, do you find the difficulty? Well, are you playing pretty, it on normal? On normal, it's pretty normal. easy. Um, it's still challenging. Don't get me wrong; I definitely died a few times. The brutes are ridiculous. I, yeah. I have the toughest time with the brutes, and if you don't tie on the rocket launcher guys perfectly, you're screwed. Um, but I think it's I think it's perfect for this game because even the boss fights are fun. Mm-hmm. So it's not to the point where you're getting frustrated. Um, but I think that what what keeps Horizon just above it for me is that Horizon is difficult enough where I feel like I'm accomplishing a feat when I complete something, mm-hmm. and not just progressing the storyline, right. which is totally fine because Spider Man is a game that needs. A, I think a wider age range to enjoy. Not that a younger kid can't play Horizon, but it's definitely not a story uh, geared towards kids. However, we did think Spider-Man was geared towards kids. We were talking about it in Discord. Um, minutes before I encountered a very violent scene in the game where you're telling someone, oh yeah, it's fine for kids. It's your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. There's not even any blood. And minutes after that, there's blood on my screen and lots of other stuff. <laughs> I was yeah. like, oh, oh, oh. Uh, Cal, hold on. This isn't for kids. <laughs> there, so, is, there, is, there is one scene that is particularly dark. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Um, and I think that the violence ramps up uh, after that considerably. Mm-hmm. So it definitely turns into a more teen adult game. Right. Um, but I think that's honestly, I think it's like should be like a 95 on Metacritic. 
I know that's high. And I know we're talking about fun versus um, content. Mm -hmm. There's still so much content in the game, too. I mean, it's not God of War. I get that. But I, I'm liking it way more than I liked. And I loved God of War, but I'm liking it more than I liked God of War. Yeah, I think I'm right there with you. Right now, it is, you know, I think I would still pick God of War as my game of the year. Uh, but this clearly is number two for me right now. I'm having a lot of fun. And I think that's the one thing I haven't had. Like after I played God of War, I had a really hard time getting into a game again or just sitting down and having a game that I, I thought about all the time and that I wanted to get back to and I was willing to leave sleep for. And I am doing that with Spider-Man again, you know, and I'm really enjoying it. Now, Tomb Raider apparently is either great or horrible. <laughs> depending on you talk to. So we have that coming up potentially too. But uh, yeah, I'm really, really enjoying spider-man i think it i don't know if it's going to actually quote unquote win game of the year which whatever that's worth to you like i don't know if any site or any major place is going to give spider-man game of the year but i think it's going to be one of those games that people are going to say like hey spider-man was really great now let's move on to the other things like god of war like celeste like probably smash brothers like those sorts of things yeah. uh, red dead redemption all that stuff even though we don't know what that game's going to be like yet but you know i think that's one that's thrown out there often but yeah I'm really impressed. I'm enjoying Spider-Man, and I'm sure by this time next week it will be 100%ed, platinum trophy attained, and then I will be anxiously awaiting the DLC in October. So yeah, that's yeah, exciting. Awesome. So hey, that's our thoughts on Spider-Man. I'm sure we will give you some final thoughts next week. Again, probably spoiler-free, just about how we thought things ended. But with that, we're going to move on to topic of the show. And on occasion, we, meaning I, like to play games on this show. And it really means that I like to create something and be like, Josh, you're going to play this game with me and you're going to like it. And today is no different. I have created a game and we are going to have some fun making difficult decisions about our gaming future and potentially one random category that is not on the list that I have in the back oh, of my mind <laughs> that might be fun just for because. So, Josh, are you ready to jump in and make some difficult decisions? This is something you love to do. Huh? It's always <laughs> you, you message me today. What are your two favorite things? I'm like, oh, <laughs> where's this going? <laughs> now you know. Now you know. So I don't think this game needs too much explanation. And we'll just jump into it. And I'm sure you'll follow. So this next question or this first question applies both to video games and board games, Josh. Mm -hmm. If you had to choose... Would you choose to only play games released after today moving forward or only play games that have already been released? So to clarify, you would never be able to play Spider-Man again because it's already been released if you picked new games. So every game would have to come out after September, we'll say Thursday, we'll say September 13th. You can play anything released after September 13th, 2018, or you can play anything released before September 13th, 2018. For the rest of your life, what would so, you pick and why? If I'm a Switch owner, I can get the best of both worlds, right? Because every game they release is an old game. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I mean, yeah, like all those remasters, the games that we played seven years ago. Yes, you could play again when they come out on Switch. That is true. So that sounds like a win-win to me, right? <laughs> no, I would only I would only play games um, released after today. Why do you say that? Because while some games have good replay value... Mm -hmm. Um, and I would miss out on a handful of games I haven't started or finished yet. Mm -hmm. uh, how, fo FOMO, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> like, how could you, like, what if you, you like, make this deal with the devil, I guess? And then, like, tomorrow they're like, well, we brought Casey Adson back and we're doing a new Mass Effect trilogy and we fired everyone from Andromeda and we're doing this new, a new engine. I'm like, I guess I can't ever play that. <laughs> well, what about the other way that you say that you only can play things going forward and then all of a sudden, you know, we have another market, that, like another early 80s situation where the, just the market drops off the bottom and we have no more new video games for like seven years. Then what do you do? Start whittling wood. <laughs> Start whittling wood. Can I okay. If I could do it like separately, if I could do board games, it would be one's previously released if it was video games it would be future release why do you say why would it be different for the two board, you could pick board games have such a better shelf life okay and they're social games so i'll be i'll be playing Catan for 
30 more years. Right. I can tell, I can promise you that. I can't promise you that I'm going to be playing Potion Explosion in 30 years or fifth and sixth student or whatever. Like I can't, I don't, I don't know. But if I look at all the games I have now, even if I wasn't even able to buy more games, I have enough in board games to play forever. But don't you have that in video games too in your backlog? You do have it for video games, but video games don't hold like the test of time. Board games, if once you go digital, you're not having board games anymore. So they're not going to change the way you play them. But if you go try to play Spider-Man on PlayStation 1 right now, you're not going to be having as great of a time as you would be if you were playing Spider-Man on PS4. Or gotcha. Try- <laughs> are there are there any games that you have not played that you would be bummed you missed out on moving forward if you were never able to play any old games anymore? Probably The Last of Us. I can't believe you still never played The Last of Us. I know. I keep wanting to start trying it, but you have it. I know. I have it downloaded. It's on my it's on the <laughs> place. Um, may, yeah, maybe I'll play it next. I don't know, but um, yeah, I mean there are games, and there's probably games I'm not thinking of. Hand of Fate Two is a game I really want to play. I just haven't mm-hmm. bought yet. Um, so there's a bunch that I would be sad I never get to play. But am I just answering these? Are you answering these? Oh, no, I'm going to answer too. But I just <laughs> like asking you a lot of questions about it. My answers are yeah. going to be quick. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but I mean, the future is so much possibility. I'm just really surprised that you picked Pass for board games if you could separate them. Because then you'd never be able to play the Horizon Zero Dawn board game. I know it's a small sacrifice to yeah. be able to keep my katan. <laughs> That's true. Precious um, katan. Yeah, so for me, I actually am probably the same. I would definitely for video games. If I could, if I had to pick one, I would pick everything moving forward, uh, because like you, I want to experience the new stuff. I there are other games that I would miss out on or be bummed that I didn't play. Absolutely, but if I haven't gotten to them yet. Right, the motivation um, isn't there. Right, like how broken up am I about it? Especially if I have them already and I haven't played them. Um, I'm not too broken up about that. So definitely things moving forward. And I think actually it might help me because then I wouldn't get so bogged down by my backlog sometimes. So I just feel like, hey, here's this new thing. And I would like to think I do a better job of buying one game at a time and playing it until I finish it, <laughs> moving on to something else. Probably yeah. wouldn't happen. I just didn't know you have a huge backlog again. But right now, I like to think that way. Uh, but I can definitely understand the sentiment for board games of just wanting to keep all the old things and the things that you know you like for sure. Um, because, yeah, board games definitely does seem to have that better shelf life. Yeah, for so. sure. All right. So for specifically video games, would you choose to only play games on a console or only be able to play games on a handheld? And for the sake of this question, mobile games and Switch are both considered a handheld. This is the easiest of your questions. It's okay. Cons- console, hands down. Okay. I'm just not... I, I, I want to be a handheld player. Mm-hmm. I'm just not. And if when I worked for Best Buy and I was on the road for three years, yeah, my PSP was my like my lifeline. But when I'm at home, I'm not going into the room to play my 3DS or, you know, that's not what I do. If I have a console, I play the console. If I'm do if I'm away from the console, I do something else. Like play a board game, go outside and do something. Like, I just don't have that want. Not that it's wrong that anyone does that, but I just don't have that want to carry a console with me anywhere. Right. I hear you. And I'm pretty much in the same boat. I just didn't know because I know you you enjoy many of your mobile app games. Yeah. I, I didn't know. I, <laughs> I didn't think that would be big enough to swing you away from console, but I'm in the same boat. Like, I have a 3DS. I have no idea where it is. I have a Vita. I know exactly where it is. And I have a Switch that I don't think I've played in like two since I stopped playing Dead Cells, like which I still want to play. It's just that other stuff has come up and I would much rather with my gaming time sit down and play on my console. And if I have the time where like something else is on the television, I usually am not a person who's going to watch TV and play a video game at the same time. Mm -hmm. I know there are people who are do that. I just can't follow both of them. Like I I can't do it. Um, So then I either would be like, well, if I'm not watching what's on TV, I might as well just be playing a console game. Or if I want to watch what's on TV, I'm not going to play my handheld. So, well, like I said, I kind of actually did that on Saturday. I was watching the Overwatch World Cup and playing <laughs> Spider-Man at the same time. It was pretty great. 
but that is something that you know I, I can't do very often and i missed a lot of the Overwatch world cup by doing that <laughs> there's a lot of things that i did not know it was going on but or i had to try to catch back up on what the storyline was for for the match that was happening my wife um, noticed that was on disney xd also yeah they have a contract they have an agreement with disney so it's on disney xd and um it was exciting because sunday uh canada and the usa played and they're two of the top teams uh, basically for each part for e- from each of these preliminary events uh the two top teams move on to blizzcon and at blizzcon is where they'll they'll play the finals to, to crown the world cup champion which has been uh, south korea the last two years probably unsurprisingly but the usa is very very good this year and canada is very very good this year and not to get super nerdy about this but the head coach of team usa is also the head coach of the Dallas Fuel of the Overwatch League. And mm-hmm. the head coach of Canada is the assistant coach for the Dallas Fuel. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it was just really funny seeing Arrow and Jane like have their teams like going at it against each other. It was cool. It was fun to watch. But anyway, enough of Overwatch League stuff. I'm sure <laughs> it's not what people are here to, to listen to. So anyway, we both agree, though. Console gaming is where it's at for us. All right, Josh, for board games, would you choose to only be able to play games with a 3.0 or higher rating, weight rating on BGG or only play games with a 2.99 weight rating or lower on Board Game Geek? That's also an easy one for me, lower for sure. Really? (laughs) Uh, Only because the replayability is higher, I think, when 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 that's lower. Gotcha. You're more likely to get other people in. It's easier to teach. It's easier to play. Sure, the games might not last as long. You might not have these crazy three-hour games that you might have from other games. But um, as much as I enjoy games that challenge me um, and that have good themes and are fun that are above three, I think above three is considered a challenging game. In my mind, at least it is. Um, So I would stick with 2.99 and lower. You're the opposite, aren't you? I am. And I yeah. think actually, I think 18 of the top 20 games on BGG, like They're overall, both. are over three. Yeah. Well, the Gloomhaven certainly is. Yeah. So I think the only two that aren't are like Pandemic <laughs> Legacy and like Seven Wonders Duel. Like it's surprising every... that Pandemic is not higher than that. Yeah. It was like a 287. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's up there. So, uh, but you can play Blood Rage. I think Blood Rage is also in that, is it just under the 3.0 threshold, uh, mechs versus minions and things like that. But yeah, I think 18 of the top 20, and I think a big chunk of the top 50 are all 3.0 or higher. And I think for me, that's just where I prefer my games. I think, like you, the, the lower weight games are better for getting people in and getting people enjoy it, like into the into the gaming hobby and to um, be able to play with friends that maybe don't play a ton of board games. But for me, where I have the most fun playing board games are with those heavier games. It's just where I enjoy it more. It's where I have more fun. It's where I want to spend my time. I enjoy a good brain burner. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I just like doing that. So if I was going to only be able to play brain burners or only be able to play, you know, more of the... I don't want to say entry level or gateway, but just more of the games that are going to be a little more, have a little more, are a little more welcoming to players. I'm going to lie on the side of of having those brain burners being what I want to do. So, and it might not be 18. It might be 16 now that I'm looking at this because I think Seventh Continent actually, I don't think is over three either. But anyway, there's a lot, there's a lot to choose from on both sides, I think. Yeah. um, There's good people on both sides. There are. There are good people on both sides. One, of, I mean, one person is right and the other is wrong, but there's good people on both it's sides. Good people on both sides. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, but that's what I would pick. I would definitely pick the 3.0 or higher games. Josh, on the other hand, is going to pick those lower weighted 2.99 and down. All right, sir. So the next one for me, which is the one I, I, I feel like is probably a very <laughs> clear answer for me, if you had to pick between only video, the only video games you get to play now, that's the important thing to know. The only games you get to play, period. Would you pick PlayStation exclusives or Xbox exclusives? That's, that's it. The toughest question uh, because there's so many Xbox. I shouldn't say there's so many. There's a lot of Xbox exclusives that I personally love, mm-hmm. like a lot that people don't necessarily. <sighs> So, like, not being able to play Forza Horizon series or any more Halos or Gears of War 
or the Crackdown games or these cool indies like that now with these new studios they bought. It would be tough. Um, yeah, because with that new investment in studios, who knows what their first part first party portfolio is going to look like in five years? And then you think of like PlayStation, you're like, do they have more God of Wars? Do they have more Uncharted left in them? Is that an empty well? Are they done with the series? Are they starting new series now? Like, if I pick PlayStation, am I not going to get any more God of Wars or Uncharted's? Where's Uncharted going if they do another one? And that's, it's tough. Um, you know, do I miss out on Spider-Man 2 and 3? And, you know, uh, it's a tough decision. Um, and I think I stay with Microsoft on this one. Um, Why do you stay with Microsoft? Because of the potential, I feel like I don't see that in my mind. So the Horizon games, they can keep on going, right? And I love the Forza Horizon games. Um, and they can change it up. They can mix it up. I don't see, like, I don't question where it's going. And I feel the same with, like, Halo and Gears of War. They, well, they're definitely for specific audiences. I think that the worlds they built are... Um, so open to new stories that don't take you out of the universe. Like when I think of like Uncharted and no, like if they did another Uncharted, I don't know that I want Uncharted without Nathan Drake. Like, I don't know that I want Last of Us. I don't know what I want from Last of Us yet because I haven't experienced it, but I don't know if players want Last of Us without Ellie or, or Joel. Like, I don't know if people want, like I can see maybe Infamous I just think for my experience with uh, the way that people view Xbox with exclusives, I get that. But for me, I think we're waiting or we're waiting and I've gotten some incredible PlayStation games to play through and missing out on uh, another horizon would be terrible uh, for me. Can you do me a favor? Yeah. So you totally froze for like Uh, 60 seconds. (laughs) Well, good. Then you lost 60 seconds of me rambling. Um, I was just rambling on and on because it's such a tough decision to make. Um, I just think that I get more enjoyment out of knowing that I still have Gears and Halo and Forza and th- whatever. They have to make a big move. They have to. So whatever is going to be next for them. Not that so many worlds, <clears throat> but I'll, I'll miss Horizon. I'll miss Spider-Man. So let me ask you the que- this question then. You have said that Horizon Zero Dawn is now one of your favorite, if not your favorite game of all time. Yeah. You say now Spider-Man is up there as one of your favorite games of all time. I know. It's weird for me to say that. But yet you're (laughs) saying, hey, company that made some of like my two of my top favorite games of all time that have come out in the last year and a half. I don't want to play your games anymore in the future. I want to play these other games. Well, I'm I'm not giving a I'm not saying I don't want to play them. I'm saying (laughs) some some weird force is stopping me from playing them. (laughs) Like if I could have it my way, I would be playing them. Uh, But also Insomniac, who knows what they could they could go into other consoles in the future, right? Mm -hmm. Like Microsoft, the games I'm talking about, they're made by Microsoft, right? Like, they're not going to PlayStation ever because they're Microsoft. You're never going to see Master Chief on the PlayStation. Sure, but you're also not going to see Nathan Drake. Yeah, but you're not going to see Nathan Drake on the PlayStation anymore. Well, right, but you're not going to see Aloy. Right, Alma's Aloy, for sure. And you're not, and depending, like, yes, Insomniac made this game, but they don't own the rights to it. So, like, it could be, you know, it could be the, you know, the, Rumor was initially that Sucker Punch was the one making this game, right. which obviously turned out to be not true, and they're making Ghost of Tsushima instead. Like you know, so you could have Spider Man Two made by a different studio. Right, it's an impossible decision for me. <laughs> but if you had to choose, you'd pick Xbox, is what you're saying. I think I have to. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah, I have to. <laughs> I have to. I don't like the decision, but I have to do it. Gotcha. I, mean, I don't like having to make the decision. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, for me, I mean, I think people are going to know. For me, I mean, the answer is pretty is pretty easily PlayStation. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that not only because of just the past games, because like I would get to play the Uncharted games again if I wanted to. You know, like I could. Yes, I might not get a new Nathan Drake adventure, but I could still play the Nathan the four 
you know, five, six, if you want to count the Vita games, uh, Nathan Drake games that I do have and be able to re-experience those in that I could do, um, you know, any options they decide to do, you know, have the, they have that new studio supposedly that they're opening outside of San Diego that most signs point to, it seems like it's going to be a, a studio that's going to be making new Uncharted games. We'll see, like who knows. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, that'd be exciting to go back and get like, uh, yes, Horizon is an amazing game, and I want to see what Gorilla can do next. I want to see what Ghost of Tsushima is. I want to see whatever this ridiculous thing that you know we're gonna get whenever Death Stranding comes out. Like, what is that gonna be? I don't know, but I want to know what it's gonna be. I want to find out what it's gonna be. It might be trash. I don't know. I'm hoping not, but it might be. Um, and I think honestly, like for me, like the fact that they have VR as an option and that there are exclusive VR games that we get to play as well is a big deal to me. I know not everyone is sold on VR. I know Donnie, if he's listening to this still, even though we're done talking about Spider-Man, is going to sigh and shake his head and talk about how stupid VR is. And that's fine. Like I, I get it's not for everyone, but I really enjoy my PlayStation VR. I have a good time with it and I like what's on the horizon for it. I like, you know, when I look forward to concrete genie and there are smaller things too like yakuza like the things that are just weird and quirky and all that stuff that you see on playstation i'm excited to continue to play those things i think microsoft has a great stable of of exclusives that are very good um but none of them have made me feel like horizon zero dawn or uncharted or god of war or spider-man have yeah they're fun but they just haven't made me feel the same way that the PlayStation games do. Um, and that's why I like PlayStation. And that's why I stick to them um, when it comes to games, because that's what it's about for me is, is games. So I changed my answer. I can't live without Horizon Zero Dawn. I have to get PlayStation. <laughs> <laughs> this wasn't me trying to conv- like convert you uh, to it. You just did it. Now I've, now all the Xbox are going to hate me. No, they're and not I just call them you. Xbox too. So that's even worse. Hey, you know, probably most of the rest of the games we're going to play this fall will probably play on Xbox. So, you know. That's true. Right. That's a good point. So there you go. It's fine. All right. Almost done with this. Just a couple things to wrap up here. We'll move along a little faster because we do have a number of listener questions to get to as well. If you had to pick between only playing board games published by a studio owned by Asmodee or only being able to play games not published by a studio owned by Asmodee, which would you pick? I, and I have to be studios owned by Asmodee because eventually they'll own all the studios. <laughs> <laughs> very possible. Very possible. Now, I mean, they have, they have a pretty uh, in-depth um, library of games. Um, and you know when Asmodee puts out a game or publishes a game or as a publisher it's because they think that the game is a quality game so i have confidence in buying it's like buying a triple a game versus a single a game i feel like Mm -hmm. Um, so i think i just have more confidence in studios or games that are under asmodee's brand i would agree i'm 100 percent on board yeah i would definitely choose to buy those that are owned by asmodee because when you just look at even if you're just like hey fantasy flight plaid hat z-man sweet you know like popular is okay right I mean, they did not get popular because they're bad. Right. So, which, uh, I'm not going to get into that argument, but they're not <laughs> popular because they're bad. So, that one, pretty straightforward. Asmodee, all the way. And second to last one, because uh, like I said, I have one fun one for you at the end here. If you had to choose between only playing deck building games or only playing worker placement games, which would you pick? <laughs> yeah, you're funny, because <laughs> this is a tough one. Uh, I think... I think I would have to pick worker placement because of the variety of games. Uh, deck builders are great, but deck builders have the stigma of once you've played one, you've played them all. I know that that's not true, but it definitely applies to a lot. There's a big umbrella under deck builders. Mm-hmm. So I would definitely have to go with worker placement games. I prefer deck building games to worker placement games, but in this situation, even I would pick worker placement games. Yeah. I feel if I if I if I had to pick a favorite, it would be deck building. But if right. I could only play one, it would be worker placement games. I would agree 100 because, like you said, like worker placement, there's so much variety in what you can do. And yes, deck builders are they different from game to game? They are, but deck building is such right now. There's not, or very rarely, do you see something truly revolutionary and different in deck building. You see different fun variations, but not something that totally changes it. Where with worker placement two games can feel completely different from each other. So 
The last question, the fun one, the one that is not game related. If you had to choose between all of the media you watch on television, on your television, if you had to choose between only being able to watch things on Netflix or everything else but no Netflix, what would you choose? Everything else but Netflix. All right. For sure. Like Game of Thrones, first of all, is <laughs> enough to not want not watch Netflix. <clears throat> and Netflix has great content, but no, it, it would be everything else. But you'd but never, Netflix. ever be able to participate in the Netflixation again. You know, I don't get to participate in Netflixation <laughs> that much anyways. <laughs> Say, Throw it out there. <laughs> J- J- Jason, hopefully, will take this as a joke because usually we get like two days notice on a Netflixation movie and I don't have time to watch it. <laughs> and I'm, I don't mean to be overly critical because they just tweeted out a nice thing. <laughs> and I don't know if they're vulnerable today or <laughs> what, but I'm not trying to bash them. <laughs> awesome. Well, hey, thanks so much. If you enjoyed our game of difficult decisions, let us know. I have plenty more in the hopper that I can do if we ever need to. So if that's something you enjoyed, or if you want to submit your own, hit us up at Board of VG on Twitter. Speaking of which, we have had multiple people who hit us up at Board with VG with questions they want us to answer. So, Josh, why don't you uh, tackle some of those questions that people have sent in? Okay, let's start right off the bat with Donnie, PSVG, at Playing Nintendo. Here's a question mark, I think, at Psychocross is prepped for. <laughs> Sorry, I just have to do that. Uh, thoughts about the wide range of reviews on Tomb Raider, speaking of, uh, by console. Take on, uh, take on reviews done pre-release. Does that make sense in a sentence? Yeah, take on reviews done pre-release of the day one patch. So how do we feel about reviews? Oh, that are take done without- on reviews yeah. done pre-release and day one patch. Uh, with so many games getting day one patches now, do you think reviews should wait to be published before final verdicts? I think we even talked about this previously, but uh, what do you think? So I think <laughs> thoughts on the wide range of reviews for Tomb Raider by console. I think it seems like most people from what I've, read or seen it seems like most people played it on xbox i think there's definitely a number of playstation reviews but just from what i was review reading and when i was watching the videos it, most of them seem to say like played on xbox um yeah i mean i don't know i think there definitely might be some uh graphical differentiation between the two though supposedly that's all gonna be taken care of in this day one patch um about some of the graphic issues and and things like that that people are having um, yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting. I don't necessarily know if I can put my finger on what else is happening that causes that. If maybe there is a, t- I don't know. I don't, I don't have a really great reason. Cause typically, you know, when, when you have Metacritic scores, you know, they're, they're usually pretty close within a point or two, um, of each other from one console to the next. So the fact that, like I said, I think when we're recording, I think there's six points apart right now. I think it's like an 83 and a 77 or something like that. Um, that's pretty unusual. And, you know the if i wanted to be a jerk i could say well the people who are playing on playstation are used to better games i don't know you know that's what the jerk in me could say i don't believe that's true though i think i want to say this is a fluke Mm -hmm. that's what my gut is but it might not be but if it's not i don't know what exactly the problem is like i said other than if there are you know that the the version on the disc or the version in the code for the Xbox version is just more complete than the PlayStation one is and that they are the PlayStation patch is going to do more than the Xbox patch is, you know, for day one. And I think reviewing games prior to the day one patch is fine as long as you acknowledge that there's a day one patch coming out. Most, you know, when we did a lot more reviews for PSVG than we do now, when we would get, you know, review docs and things like that, like if there was a day one patch, it would often outline what's going to be there um, and what's going to be included in that day one patch. So, you know, I think if you just acknowledge the fact that, hey, there's a day one patch coming, um, it says that these things are going to be addressed. Just note that I, you know, during my playthrough, I either acknowledged or did not acknowledge or this was an issue or was not an issue for me. So I think you can totally do that um, in your review and then maybe, ad- I don't want to say adjust it, but revisit it potentially after that day one patches out to see if it takes care of things. Um, I do think reviews should be more of a living thing than they are because I think mm-hmm. that if, if I go and look at a review today it should represent the game i can buy today 
because that to yeah. me is like that's why I'm looking at the review because I want to I'm interested in buying this game so I want to know what it is um, today you know and so that's kind of where I think reviews should sit so I do think that they should be living things that they should not be a snapshot in time like they currently are for most places um, but that's my really long winded answer to that question what do you think sir so I mean someone gave Tomb Raider a 40 on the PlayStation that's why the PlayStation score is so drastically different than the Xbox. I'm mm. pretty sure there's not a 40 on the Xbox. But when you have someone who puts out a review like this, then you have to start wondering, are they doing this for attention? Is this a legitimate, like, because that's a big disparagement from 90 to 40. Um, but to also be fair, there's also 60 from GameSpot, um, from the Guardian 60, like there's places that are giving it lower scores. So I don't necessarily, I kind of agree with you. Like, I don't necessarily know where this is coming from, like the difference between like the systems, like why that's happening, whether more people play. There's only two more reviews on the Xbox than on the PlayStation. Um, there's just not, there's no negative reviews for the Xbox version. So realistically, because of a 40, we're seeing a six-point swing. And it's actually only a four-point now. It's, it's a 78 and an 82. Oh, 78, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, it's unfortunate that that happens. Do I think... So to talk about board games, kind of in the same vein, so one of the um, companies that reviews board games that I follow posted a couple of days ago, like what do you I wonder what would happen if we actually started reviewing games, board games the day they come out and are available to the general public as opposed to reviewing them early. Obviously it's not the same with like a day one patch, but there I I genuinely don't know what um feedback they got from that question, but when you're reviewing something like a board game that is not gonna be changed from when you're playing it to when someone else plays it. Plays it. I totally get that. That's a fair review. If you're playing Assassin's Creed Origins or Brotherhood, I shouldn't use Origins. Origins wasn't too bad. Um, Brotherhood, um, which received a huge day one patch and a st- uh, like essentially whether it was bugs or changing parts of the game, whatever it was, made the game much more enjoyable for people. Yeah, that's going to affect. Imagine if you took reviews for Master Chief Collection today and compared them to Master Chief Collection reviews when that came out. Master Chief Collection was unplayable when it came out, and they acknowledged that. They still released that game. So should a company be forced to suffer bad reviews because of that? Maybe. You know, maybe companies would start taking their time and putting the game out when it's actually finished and not rushed. However, if you're a person who's relying on game reviews to buy games, you kind of have to be a little bit more educated yourself to go off of reviews like that. Like, maybe I'll look at that guy who gave a 40 to the Tomb Raider and compare it to someone who gave it a 90 before I decide what I think is the best decision, um, because you also don't know what you're getting in that aspect either. But yeah. I, don't know. I don't know. That's what I think. Like. Well, and I think for me, with when it comes to game reviews, my big thing is I always find someone who tends to have, you know, that you trust and that you feel has uh, taste similar to what yours are. And then if they review a game and they give it a score and you can be like, you know what, I've felt similar to them about games in the past. There's a good chance I'll feel similar about this one. So that's why there's so many different reviewing sites and so there are many different things. Um, Open Critic has it at an 81 because they just put all the scores together. Uh, okay. So they put everything together. So they have it at an 81. Um, and I think that's the big difference too, is that like on Metacritic, the Xbox page has like two perfect tens and the, the highest like PlayStation scores are 95, you know? So I think like all of that plays into um, all of that stuff, you know? So, but yeah, but like I said, on, on open critic is at an 81 overall because they just smush everything together. So, but yeah, good question though, Donnie, as always, keeping us honest, asking us the hard kidding <laughs> things. What's our next question, sir? Our next question is from Denny, a beer guy at Loose Screw. <clears throat> pardon me. He says, um, I've been seeing a wide range of video game themed Monopoly board games, Fortnite, Mario, 
Assassin's Creed, Warcraft, etc. Uh, do you guys have much experience with any of the themed Monopoly games, especially any of the newer game versions? <clears throat> so I will say, first off, I've heard great things about Monopoly Gamer and Mario Kart Monopoly Gamer. <clears throat> that being said, they're not typical Monopoly games. So like the Fortnite, the Mario, uh, the Fortnite, the Warcraft, um, Firefly, Buffy, all these ones, those are just skinned Monopolies, which is just Park Place is named something after your favorite show. Um, but when you look at the Monopoly Gamer, it's te- it's Monopoly, but it's rethemed and it plays different. So right. like the Monopoly Gamer, you're playing like you go around the board a certain amount of times, but you're also like fighting Bowser, like you're fighting a boss, and like you get different rewards and you get power up. So there's it it definitely turns um, Monopoly on its side a little bit. Uh, I don't really have any need to play any other games but base Monopoly, and it's not a game we play often. I'll we'll play with family every once in a while. Um, so I'm totally fine with just regular Monopoly. But I wouldn't say no if someone was like, do you want to play Fortnite Monopoly? I'd be like, sure, I'll play any Monopoly, really. Because um, I, I genuinely enjoy the game. It's just, it's not one of those games that I play often. What about you? Any experience with the newer Monopolies? No, because I'm not a Monopoly fan. So <laughs> I avidly, I actively try to avoid Monopoly in general. I'll play it if somebody wants to. But if I am choosing a game, I'm almost never going to choose Monopoly. Um, I think there are some good things it can teach, especially if you're working with kids in math. Like there's some good things that can be there as far as the banker and make a change and all that good stuff. But I'm just not a huge fan of roll and move games in general. I think they can be challenging to to be fun for me at least. So, um, but I have heard, like you said, I've heard Monopoly gamers quite a bit different. I would definitely be down to check it out. And I wouldn't be opposed to buying a skinned version of Monopoly. It would just be bought because I really like the IP. Right. You know, so I might, yeah, exactly. That would be the reason I would probably buy it if I was going to. All right. And our last question of the week comes from super listener, super listener Splig at Delicious on Twitter. What games make you happy? Table, TV, floor for Josh. Uh, he says he's been down recently and needs a pick-me-up. Well, I'm sorry to hear that you've been down lately, Splig. I hope things turn around for you. Um, and what games make me happy? Honestly, uh, Overwatch makes me happy. When I play Overwatch, even if it goes poorly, I always am smiling when I'm playing that game. I have a great time with it. It makes me feel better. The world, the color, the vibrancy, the music, the audio cues, the voice lines, the emotes. Like that game just puts me in a good mood. I love playing Overwatch and I love playing it. If I've had a really bad day, it always is the thing that's going to put me in a bit of a better mood. Um, So yeah, Overwatch. That is the game I play that puts me in a better mood. Josh, how about you, sir? So, uh, I mean, in first play, it really depends on like, if you have people to play with you, that's definitely a different answer than if you just kind of need something to unwind. <clears throat> like for me, like some of the best times I have with my friends are playing games like Seven Wonders or Dead of Winter, where you can kind of laugh um, and have fun. Even like social deduction games where like after a round's over, you get to like, you know, talk and about who was who and and have a lot of fun like that. Um, I'm really still enjoying Villainous a lot. Um, so that's been fun for me. And like, if we're talking like by yourself, like just kind of need to feel better and pick yourself up kind of thing. Um, like I put my headphones on and I'll put either a podcast or I'll put on a new album I haven't heard. Um, and I'll jump into a game like Destiny where I don't need the audio. I'll just mute the TV and I'll jump into Destiny, and that just scratches an itch for whatever reason. I could see Overwatch being the same, but, like, before I had my son, like, when I was down, if I was home on a Saturday and my wife was working, I would pop on the headphones and I would play Destiny for eight hours. I'd just sit on the couch, and I would just feel good about it. I wouldn't feel like I'm wasting a day. I was just like, this is me time. I'm listening to four new albums. I'm catching up. On podcasts, I mean, do what makes you happy. If you have things you can do while you're doing things, that's great. But 
Um, if you even want to just go watch watch it plays on YouTube, you could do that if you just want to get a good gaming experience. Um, like do what I did and watch a bunch of kids play through The Last of Us and see 15 different kids' reactions to what's happening as they play through the game. I love stuff like that too. So, I mean, find what works for you, but um, those would be the games I would recommend for me at least. And watch Magic for Humans on Netflix. Oh man, watch Magic for Humans. What an incredible show. Yes, it is. If it doesn't make you feel good uh, after watching it, I don't know what will. Watch Magic for Humans. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if I want to go quite that far. I felt so good. It made me. So I know good. it's great. I'm just saying, like you know, that <laughs> I don't want to put that pressure on the show, and that I don't want people, someone that if they watch it and don't feel great, and then suddenly feel like there's something not correct with them. So it's don't a good. Don't be like show, Donnie and Google how to do every magic trick in the show. That is true. Don't do that. Um, did you know that he that um, the the person from Magic from Humans is the host from Cupcake Wars? Is he really? Yeah. <laughs> Which I was like, I know I've seen him from somewhere. I was racking my brain. I'm like, I know I've seen him on a like. I knew he was a magician and stuff, but I was like, I, he was on a television show. What is it? He was totally the host on Cupcake Wars on Food Network. There you go. <laughs> the more you know. I know. So anyway, hey, this has been a pretty beefy long episode. Josh, what do you say we wrap this yeah. show up? Of course, of course. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Uh, remember, you can find us on social media at Board with VG. Use that hashtag, hashtag board with VG, facebook.com slash board with VG. And as always, we're just waiting on that dice tower and fan fiction emails at board with VG at gmail.com. Uh, what's I going to say? That Patreon tier, we're as a group, the Make Us Better group, we're $40 away from getting a board with video games podcast page on stitcher on itunes on spotify you can tell your friends just go to board with video games they don't have to go search through a thousand psvg episodes not that we don't love being a part of them but this is a good test experiment for the group this is going to be my plug segment also by the way uh so if that's something you want to see um that's that's how we have to get it done uh, through Patreon. I'm already donating. I'm I'm capped at my donation, <laughs> so I'm not pushing that any higher just to get our own feed. I guess I probably could, huh? Um, but other than that, um, yeah, we love doing this. I've said um 15 times because I'm just tired. Uh, those are my plugs. Go to Patreon. Give us some money. <laughs> we can do our own thing, uh, so to speak. We're doing our own thing. This isn't like nothing's going to change just it'll be easier for you to find us correct um, and it will be easier for us to get two companies yes they don't have to jump through obstacles to find us because companies aren't going to do legwork to find us we're doing that to get to them mm -hmm. um, so it'll open more doors for us and for you guys more Absolutely. giveaways more board games means more giveaways that's right well tell the good people where they can find you yeah, so you can find me at all the typical places, uh, Twitter, Instagram, PlayStation Network, Xbox Live, Board Game Geek, all at PsychoCross, C-Y-C-O-C-R-O-S-S. -S. Uh, if you want to play some Overwatch on PlayStation Network or Xbox Live, come hit me up. I would love to. I'm, I, I've am i been having a huge Overwatch itch, but I it, it's hard for me to go play by myself when I can play Spider-Man by myself. So if you want to play, <laughs> let me know, and I will jump over and play some Overwatch and go back to Spider-Man. But as always, if you have suggestions for future topics, be sure to reach us out to us on the social media because we want to talk about what you want to hear about. Thank you so much for being here with us each week. Next week, Josh, can you believe it? Episode 50 next week. That's incredible. That is incredible. 50 weeks we've been doing this. Actually, 51 weeks because we took one week off one time. Uh, oh, we but did that's... a double episode one week. Oh, we did do a double episode one week, so I guess we really <laughs> have pretty much done. Yeah, 50 weeks next week. Crazy to think about. But hey, again, thanks for coming on this wild ride with us. We love it that you are here listening, interacting, talking with us about the things you want to talk about. It's been great. And remember, everyone, whether it be board games or video games, never stop gaming. Stop gaming.